Okay, so this is May 17th and we are meeting to talk about migrating from Code Mirror 5 to Code Mirror 6. And Johan is pushing on this and has a presentation. So I'll stop talking. Johan, we, we're not getting sound from you. Yeah, okay. Is it better now? Okay, so let me share again the screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. yep. Okay, so let's go. Uh, so uh, thank you all for attending this uh, presentation. So I will start with uh, presenting the new architecture of Conmural 6 because it is very different from Conmural 5. Uh, present a new feature and how things are supposed to articulate together. And then I will show how to do that in uh, JupyterLab. So uh, the first thing, the first big change is Conmural is the modularity. So the package has been split into many packages. So I'm not listing all of them, but the main ones that we use. So the first one is the state, which provides data structures for the editor state and change to that uh, state. We have view, uh, which is basically a display component that shows the editor state to the user. We have the comment. So comment are just like a list of editing comments and key bindings for some of them. And another one that we will use is a language. So it's an interface for defining language extensions and highlighting. With that four packages, you can set up an editor with most of the features we need in JupyterLab. So here is an example. So you start uh, by initiating a state. So a state stores, uh, among other things, uh, the document itself, extensions. I will come back to that point later. And then we instantiate a view on that state. So the view embeds the state and uh, a DOM element, which is the parent. So where you want to attach the editor. Uh, the idea in this uh, new version of Code Mirror is that the state is immutable. So you never change directly the state. Uh, instead, you create what we call transaction. So transaction embeds changes to the doc, but you can also uh, embed other changes to the state, uh, the extension, and things like that, that we, I will come back later. And then you dispatch this transaction to the view, and it will update uh, the DOM and display everything correctly. So this is basically data flow. So you have a DOM event, can be whatever we want, um, mouse click, uh, keystroke, which is bound to a command, whatever. It will generate a transaction. The transaction embeds both uh, the changes and the state. It will produce a new state, and then the view will apply this new state. So that for the general review. So now we can dive a bit more into uh, how the state is uh, stored. So the first thing is the um, first thing to see in the position. So in Conmural 6, we use only offsets from the start of the documents, while Conmural 5 was using a pair of line character, which has a position from the start of the line. So that has changes. It still pr provides uh, indexes by line. So you can index by line, it will be fast, but it's not the way, a recommended way to update and um, produce changes. Uh, another change is that uh, line index in Conmural 6 starts at 1 versus 0 in Conmural 5. And so uh, I just introduced convenient functions uh, to convert between all side position and offsets. So basically, these functions, they are currently in Conmural, but uh, in Jupyter Lab, sorry, but we should be able to remove them once the migration is done. It's just that I haven't checked that uh, Jupyter Lab extensions uh, use that. So that's something to check before removing them. Uh, another thing to know about positions is that Code Mural 6 provides a position mapping feature. So basically, when you want to uh, do some changes, you may want to uh, know the ending position of your change in a new document, which you do insertion and deletions. So that's what we have in the, in the um, transaction objects, and more precisely in the changes of the transaction object. So here we start with the duck, which is one, two, three, four. Uh, and we have two changes. So the first one is deleting uh, character one from one to three, and then we insert at the beginning the character zero. And we want to know the position at the end of the old document. We want to know it in the new document. So here it's three, okay? So that's for the positions. Another thing that is stored into the state. So 
beyond the document itself and the extensions are selections. So selections are just like multiple ranges. It can be either a cursor, which, so that is an empty uh, selection, or a true range. So you have ensure and add, which defines a range. And internally, uh, overlapping ranges are automatically merged, and the ranges are sorted. Um, by default, you can have only one uh, main range, and you need to enable other ranges uh, via extension. So this is an example where we create like uh, a state with the document, so hello, and we have here two selections, one which selects uh, character from zero to four, so this part, and another one which is an empty selection just after the last, uh, the last character. Uh, so this is the extensions that allow multiple selections. And then if I want to uh, do some update, I can say, okay, I want to replace all the selections with uh, the, uh, this exclamation mark. And then the new document will be only exclamation mark or exclamation mark, okay? So a quick overview of migration. Uh, so from all the methods in Commerce 5 to new ones in Commerce 6. So I'm not going to list all of them just to give you like yeah, just an overview. And if you want an exhaustive list, you can go to uh, this part of the documentation. So it's uh, convenient to retrieve how to how to do things. So that's for the data model. And uh, now things about Scanner uh, 6 is that everything has been, I mean, everything, no, but a lot of things has been uh, pulled out of Scanner uh, 6 and you need to use extensions to uh, set up different features. So you, we don't have uh, any set of name options anymore like we had in the previous version. We have now a tree of extensions. This is ancient, this, sorry, these extensions uh, can be are stored in the state. They can be arbitrary nested. So you can have like a really uh, complicated tree of extensions. You can have me, uh, same extensions appearing in different parts of the tree and uh, the configuration process will use a deduplication. And in many cases, the order of extensions is relevant. So that's something to keep in mind because uh, it can be problematic when you want to uh, enable or disable extensions on the fly. So extensions can come from a lot of different uh, sources in Commodore 6. So we have what we call facet providers. So I will come back to that later. Basically, they are um, label values. We have state fields. So state fields are used to store additional states. We have view plugins, so that's for controlling how you just add some decoration or things in the, to the view. We have themes, and anything actually providing an extension property uh, can be have as an extension. So the definition of the extension type is this one. So either an array of extension or an object providing an extension property. So back to the facet provider. So the facet is uh, the more basic. Uh, thing to do some configuration. So it's a label value associated with an interstate. It takes inputs from any number of extensions and combines them into a single output. So for instance, here I'm creating a state with an extension for the tab size and an extension for the change filter. And then I can retrieve the state uh, with this function, the facet function, and just name the facet I want and I get the value. The issue with facets, if you use them as we just did, is that uh, it sets once for good, so we cannot reconfigure them. So if you want to have a dynamic configuration, you need to use a thing called compartment. Uh, and this one allows you to reconfigure a tree of extension or part of the tree. So it's done by, just like you will update the state with a transaction, you will just reconfigure with a transaction. So here is an instance, here is an example, sorry. So we create like compartment for the language and the tab size, uh, basic setup is just like a bunch of different extensions when you don't want to set up everything. So you have a basic feature with that. So it's not relevant here. And here we just say, okay, I want to use my facet tab size into the type size compartment. Same for the language. So I use Python, which is an extension, a function returning an extension. And you say, okay, my compartment language will be configured with that at the beginning. And later, if I want, for instance, to change the tab size, I just like dispatch a transaction, which will uh, embed an effect and an effect would just be, okay, I just reconfigure the step size based on uh, the new value. 
another thing about dynamic configuration is we may want to inject extensions. So uh, typical example will be the gutter for the debugger. So when you uh, start the debugger, you want the gutter to appear. And when you start the debugger, you want the gutter to disappear. So for that, we use a special effect called append config and append config allows you to just inject extension. If you want to remove it, we can use uh, the reconfigure and passing an empty list of extensions. We have to be careful with this one because it will remove all the extensions that have been in the injected. It will keep only states and compartments that were here before the append config. So that's something to be careful with. Uh, a better solution is to have a compartment that you inject in the beginning and then you, you reconfigure the compartment with an empty list of extensions. So this way the compartment is always here and you just like changing what he, uh, he can let. And the deduplication process will just remove all the uh, empty uh, extensions. So uh, now I just like show some code uh, regarding the, uh, the um, migration of the configuration. Uh, so I just have to, I think, I can. can you see my code? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so as I said, there is no more um, uh, mapping uh, of options with the name, and it was quite convenient to have it in the API of the uh, Cloud Mirror package of JupyterLab. So I just like created it back. Uh, so the way I did that is I have like a lot of extensions builder because yeah, if you remember, extensions can be built from facet, but they can be pro provided directly. They can be conditional extensions, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of different way to build extensions and I just like wrap the, uh, this in a common way to do it. Uh, so it's easier to map, to store them in a map and build them on demand. So this is all the machinery for building extensions. It's not really important to the type. Yeah, and that's the idea. So the idea is to have a map where I got a mapping between the name of the extensions and the different uh, extensions themselves. And then I have different functions. So I have a reconfigure. So reconfigure extension is the equivalent of the set option you had in the old API of Conmira. Uh, that means the Conmira package of the lab. So I can reconfigure a single uh, option. I can reconfigure whatever I want uh, passing a partial uh, configuration. And I can inject the extension. And this one just like convenient functions for getting the initial uh, configuration. So yeah, if you're searching for the new set option in uh, Jupyter Lab, that will be this file. So editor configuration that yes, the Conmira package. Uh, I think yeah, that's mostly it for that. So back to the slides. So that was for the basic configuration. Uh, now, I'm back, um, now I'm, we'll talk about the state fields. So which are another source of extensions. So this one are used to store additional information in the state. Uh, for instance, you start the debugger, you want to store the breakpoints. And so the breakpoints will be stored in the in this state field. Uh, as other part of the state, state fields store immutable values and they are updated with transactions. So here is an instance where I just like count, uh, count the number of changes in the document. So I define a state field. So a state field basically provides two methods. The first one is initialization method. And the other one is an update method. So this one will take uh, the, the current value of the, of the field and a transaction object. And will just like return the new value of the field based on the transaction. Another source of extension is a view plugin. So the view plugin is used to add and manage DOM elements and do a lot of things that depend on the current viewport. Uh, view plugins should not store states. So basically just like for decorating things and uh, you try to retrieve the state if you need it from the state objects. And when you reconfigure, so if you remember this uh, effect uh, when we're talking about uh, reconfiguration, when you reconfigure a state, uh, if the view plugin are not uh, included in the new configuration, they are removed. So that's something to keep in mind when you, you use this feature. So this is an example of a view plugin that just like prints the size of the documents uh, in the corner. So the view plugin is defined like from a class, from an anonymous class. So you provide a constructor, you provide an update function, and you provide the destroy function. 
and then just yeah some basic implementation so that was for the extensions now we uh number six providing new kind of objects called decorations and uh, this one uh the mechanism used by extensions to influence what the document look like so we have four types of decorations so the first one are mark decorations so that's for adding style or DOM attributes to the text in a given range basically if you want to underline some part of the text or add some some markers you use mark decorations we have widget decorations so you can uh, literally add a new DOM element at a given position which is not uh, text we have replace decorations so for hiding parts of the document or replacing it with something else. So that's what we use for folding code, for instance. And we have line decorations that can add attributes to align wrapping elements. So if you want to highlight a uh, whole line, for instance, on changing the color of the whole line, you can use line decorations. And so now I will just illustrate how we use all of that uh, in the migration of the debugger. So basically, when uh, for the new debugger, we need state fields to store the breakpoints and whether a breakpoint was hit. We need effects to update these stats, these states, sorry. We need a gutter for setting the breakpoints. We need markers for um, drawing the breakpoints. We need, uh, we need a line decoration for highlighting the line once the code has stopped. And we need a compartment for adding, removing the gutter on demand. So let's start with the state effects in the compartment. So basically, the gutter is an empty compartment. So that's when we instantiate the um, editor handler. So for now, the compartment is empty. Uh, we define two effects. So I think I haven't spoken about the effects yet. So basically, a state effect uh, is just an object, uh, a template object. So we just define what it will uh, store and embed in the transactions. And we provide a map. Uh, function. So remember this mapping position feature in the changes. So that's the same with the effect. So we can map changes. So we are sure we have the right positions in the uh, document, in the new document. And we have two effects here. So one for the breakpoints, one from one for the uh, highlighting effect. Then we define markers and decorations. So uh, for highlighting, we directly use uh, a line constructor from uh, the decoration class. And we just like this is like uh, CSS style. Uh, and we define a breakpoint marker. So for this one, we just uh, inherit from the gutter marker and we provide, we implement the to-do method. So here we just like create a text node and then all the styling is done through CSS. And then we can implement the state field. So a state field uh, can be built from uh, the state field class. So you define what it embeds. So most of the time it will, it will be a range set of something. So here it's a range set of markers. Uh, the create function will just return an, an empty set, of course. And the update functions will accept so the value of the state, the breakpoints, and the transactions. Transaction will de describe the uh, the changes. So in our cases, in our case, really, what we are looking for is so transaction effects, and we want a breakpoint effect. So when there is a change, uh, can we just like uh, dispatch the um, the transaction to the view, which internally will call the update methods of all the states and state field objects. So we want to filter that to be sure we only handle the breakpoint effect. And then we do what we have and we do have to do three. And if there is any new breakpoints, uh, we use the marker that we defined before. So this marker is called by addressing, okay, um, create me a range of marks based on your argument. And that will just like draw uh, the marks. Otherwise, we'll just return an empty set and uh, all the markers are removed from the view. That's also breakpoint state field. Uh, the highlighting state field uh, is a bit similar. So we have a create function, which is uh, no decoration at the start. Then we have the update function taking, so the uh, highlight value and the transaction. We do exactly the same as before. So filtering the state effect, uh, filtering to have the highlight effect. And the only difference is we need to uh, add this field provide, which means which uh, tells the editor that um, this uh, state field provide a new decoration. So that's the only difference with the previous uh, state field. And then we can 
provide the gutter and inject it into uh, the configuration of the editor. So that's when we start the debugger, basically. So first, we set the line number. So meaning I'm just like adding a new gutter with, for, with the line number. This one is uh, provided by, uh, by uh, column number six, and it's mapped uh, with this name through the mechanism I just showed before. And then we change the gutter. So gutter is an array of extensions. So we put the states, both states in the extension. And then we create a gutter, which is also an extension. Remember I said that uh, the order of extensions may be relevant. Here I want to ensure that this uh, gutter will be the first one. So I can use something called uh, precedence.is. So even if another extensions or a JupyterLab extensions or anything else added, already added other gutters, I'm pretty sure that this one will be the first one. And the gutter is defined uh, this way. So the class is the... Uh, CSS selectors that will be applied to the uh, to the gutter. Uh, the render empty elements say, okay, do you want to see the yeah, elements when they're empty? So obviously yes. The markers is what uh, state field we use to uh, to add mark in the in the gutter. Initial spacer is just something to ensure that the gutter will be drawn even if it has nothing in the beginning. And then we can add some dumb event handlers. So here we want to handle when you click on the gutter to add breakpoints. So that's the way it's done. And finally, we just call this inject extension that I showed before with the compartment configured with this breakpoint uh, gutter extension list. So that's for building everything. Now we need to handle the different events. So the first one is when we have to uh, handle a mouse down event. So without getting um, giving all the details, basically we arrive here with a pose a position argument, which is like the offset from the start of the document. We uh, just read the state field, breakpoint state field, uh, try to find if we have already have a breakpoint. In that case, we need to remove the breakpoint. Otherwise, we need to add it. Then, so that's what we do here. And finally, we send the breakpoint lead to the kernel. Then the kernel will set the breakpoints into the debugger and then send back the answer. And that's where we update the markers uh, in, the, in the editor. So we just like read the breakpoints. We clear the gutter. So we remove all the existing breakpoints. And then we create the new, uh, the new breakpoints. And we update the state by dispatching and transaction. So here we use the breakpoint effect that we have created before and say, okay, create a new effect with this list of breakpoint position. And then everything will be updated thanks to the dispatch mechanism of code mirror sets. For editing line, it's exactly the same uh, principle. So first we dispatch an effect, which is empty, meaning, okay, remove the current line, I, sorry, remove the current uh, highlighting. And then we compute uh, the position of the line that we should highlight, we dispatch a new effect. So that's it for the uh, presentation. I will not dive into the whole PR because it will just take hours. So I think like that's most of the things we need for uh, migrating to number six. And I'm ready to uh, answer any question. Thanks for showing this. This is um, really helpful. <clears throat> um, I don't know, I was wondering as you were showing the debugger example, um, how different that extension code looks for Code Mirror 6 compared to Code Mirror 5. Um, so the Code Mirror 5 one is presumably still in the repo and we can go compare the two. I'm just curious if you are authoring something that interacts with the editor in that sort of way, like it's fairly sophisticated. How much work will you have to do to migrate your extension? How hard is, is, is that, do you think? Um, it depends on whether we use uh, API from the debugger itself on Frequent Mirror. Uh, I mean, I tried to keep as much SPI as I could and just replace the implementation. So, uh, I think for people using the package, it should be relatively straightforward. 
maybe they will need some guidance uh, because like you can have some interaction that uh, can lead to some bugs, but it should be quite easy. For people maintaining the debugger, we definitely have to dive into the details of code mirror and understand how it works. So that's why I started with that in the beginning and not just reading code and explaining what it does. But uh, another thing that is uh, really helpful, you know, there is a list of um, examples in the documentation. I mean, not like uh, simple examples, but uh, real case, real use case. So that's really helpful. And uh, also the author is very, very responsive on the discourse. So in the chat, Jason Grell is asking about the timeline for merging this into master. Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, so I have only one thing that's missing, which are uh, which is sorry, uh, the mark uh, in the kernel package, but like it's, like it's a bit function, so it should be like quite quick. Especially that now I have experience with uh, with my declarations and marks. Uh, so I hope to finish, when I mean finish, I mean like you should have the same features. Now a lot of tests uh, obviously won't work because the DOM has changed. So we need to rewrite these tests. And that, I don't know how long it takes, but I think we need people on that. Uh, there is another P, uh, question by Jason, but before we get to that, uh, I think a major challenge would be to get reviews from people who are not at Quantstack. Um, we'll probably also do reviews by people in the team. Um, and, and so it will certainly impact people outside of the JupyterLab repositories who are building upon uh, code mirror, like uh, the folks who were working on LSP, um, like the code mirror six uh, was funded by a client of Quantstack who really is into improving the rendering performances of JupyterLab, which was their main motivation, but another area where this migration should be very impactful is accessibility, which is also why we pinged Isabella, because basically, as far as I understand, Code Mirror 5 is a black box for screen readers and these kinds of uh, tools, where Code Mirror 6 should work better. And, and so um, it, it's not a trivial one. And, and so my take on this is that let's say that we get the last feature and the, like the tests are passing. And then, you know, we are certainly going to find other things. And in my opinion, we should merge it into a pre-release of JupyterLab 4 if we want it in as early as possible. So then people can try and can, you know, try, you know, updating their extensions and whatnot, because we can't squeeze in a change like that like that has so much impact on the entire JupyterLab code base, like too late. So I think we have some very real constraints that can guide us here. We either have to put this in to JupyterLab 4 or JupyterLab 5 or never. Those are really the three options. So obviously waiting till five seems so far away that it is almost the same as never. So really the choice is, do we put this in JupyterLab 4 or not? And I think the questions that Jason Grau is asking in the comment that Nick made in the chat are really the questions we need to answer. Is this a component that we can rely on indefinitely into the future? Um, it may delay force release, it may not, I don't know, <clears throat> but, um, but regardless, since it's going to have 
API incompatibilities and we want to respect Sember, we kind of have to make a decision to put it in for or to just not do it. And I am deeply hesitant uh, to use Monaco. So I wouldn't really even entertain that. Uh, but like, that's just me and I have my own weird positions on this. So um, yeah, I don't know. But Johan, you know this component better than anyone else on this call. And you've had some uh, exposure to how mature it seems and how reliable it seems. Like how comfortable do you feel with it? Okay, so uh, first thing, disclaimer, I don't know Monaco, so I cannot compare to Monaco. Uh, now the thing is, I think it's a bit, um, and you get time to get it, to get used to the new architecture. But once you get it, it's really neat. And I think it's a way to do things. So it's really, yeah. I mean, everything is well separated. You have really clean uh, concepts. And so, yeah, just, yeah, it takes some time to understand the mechanics, but I think it did the thing right. So that's the first point. The second one is even if there is uh, a single author behind the mirror, as I said, it is very responsive on the discourse. And I mean, I had a bug in Code Mirror 6 and he fixed, that, he fixed it in three hours. So, uh, okay, it was an easy one to fix, but even if you like, yeah, you just browse uh, the, the discourse is uh, yeah, super active everywhere. So there are a lot of examples, people asking questions with the answers that we can reuse to implement things. So I am quite confident if in the, uh, how to say that? And the fact that the team will get the skills to master open number six and uh, and uh, have everything working as we want in the Jupyter lab. That's my feeling. I mean, the, uh, an additional thing that I see is, is super valuable. If we start building the muscles to work around CM6, adopting Prosmere would be a relatively short hop from there. They share many architectural similarities. And you know, if we're talking someday about really controlling how we do markdown, that's what we want, right? We don't want this rendered, unrendered thing. We want rich text editing that you do in your editor. And Prosmere, a lot of people build stuff on top of it or whatever, but um, it is it is the tool that we would want if we would want to get people out of handwriting square brackets and you know curly braces and stuff like that to write markdown. Uh, so. I think that model that it's exposing, I mean, yeah, Monaco has a, has a, a, a nice model for, for doing um, the, uh, the change management um, and, and transaction management and all that. Um, what we can't use it for is it's very hard to put, each of them is very expensive that you put on the screen. And so like for the notebook model, it's, it's almost a non-starter. We can't, we can't put that many Monaco's on the screen. It, it just won't, like if we did it, it would have to be, the background of each document would be a Monaco document. And then we would move other stuff around the Monaco document, right? Um, and like implement virtual scroll inside the Monaco document. So yeah, and then the author of Codemere, that's the other thing, right? So this is not just an author, right? Like every iteration of Jupyter has been built on top of this author's work. This is a very good friend to our community, right? Um, and the community process has gotten much more robust around that, right? Because it was a single gatekeeper for a really long time. So we have much that we could learn from, from what they did. I had a, a total corollary question, but this is important stuff to have. So, um, but yeah, th those are some of my, my, my thoughts. Thank you, Johan. Yeah, okay. uh, I have another perspective, which is more related to the funding situation of all of this. Um, so maybe Isabella will have more to say about it, but uh, so my understanding is that Code Mirror 5 is a no-go for accessibility. And doing this migration, that we managed to sell this migration to a client and to motivate it because of the great performance improvements, right? 
of code mirror six over code mirror five, right? So there are other benefits, but it's also very important for accessibility. And if it took significant effort to do it, not like full-time effort by Johan, but like several months. And it's very unlikely that if we make this tool and not get it merged for the Lab 4, that we can do this again, you know, in a year from now. So, yeah. Uh, so strategically, I think it's important to realize that um, it's a, probably a big part of the accessibility effort to migrate to Code Mirror 6 or some other editor than Code Mirror 5. And that, you know, getting someone to fund this very complex migration fully is not easy. I don't think I can add anything too intelligible about Code Mirror 6. Like I've read a little bit about it, but I don't have the depth of understanding I think that's shown, but I can definitely confirm Code Mirror 5 is not a solution that can be like we can't fix it to make it accessible, for example. Like that, that that is absolutely true. Yeah, the thing is the extension system of Code Mirror 6 is really powerful because you can inject whatever you want and just like control whatever you want, stay the view or the interact. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, my very vague understanding of it was big, like a lot of those changes were, I'm sure there are other reasons as well, but a lot of those changes were motivated by the accessibility issues because as you talked about, like there's a lot of trees now and it totally changes the way it's right, interacting with the DOM, which I know were both motivations for that. So I, but yeah, I, I'm not saying that Code Mirror 6 is probably the only accessible editor out there. Just, just to be clear, since I, yeah, I don't want to make promises, but I do know that it's, it is an option that seems to be better. I'm also looking for, there's a talk about it. So I'm interested to see how they demo what the expected experience is. So I can link that if y'all are interested. Yeah, please. Um, it has, I don't, I don't know how much of a non-starter this is. And I think Sylvan probably can answer this question better than most because of your familiarity with NumFocus. What do you think the prospects are of inviting CodeMirror as a project into NumFocus? Um, uh, it's not a scientific, uh, I mean, it's not a, a project for scientific computing, but That's there true. are a few exceptions in the non-focus affiliated projects that, of projects that are not scientific in nature, but have been widely adopted specifically within the scientific computing community, open source community and that were accepted. Uh, so up until about a year ago, it was the job of the board to accept uh, pro uh, affiliated projects. Uh, now we have an affiliated project committee that does this. So I can't, I don't know what would be the answer, but is CodeMirror affiliated to any? Well, I just looked up the, um... I looked up the code mirror repos <clears throat> GitHub folder and there's a funding.yml file in there. And the funding links that it had were the author's web page and a PayPal. So it sounds like it, there's no official affiliation with any organization. And it seems like if the author's open to it, something like affiliation with NumFocus makes it easier to get funding to the author and it makes it easier to build a case for relying on code mirror instead of something written by a trillion dollar corporation. Like it's, if, if you didn't know anything about this landscape and you were just trying to pick between two modern 
web editor components, one of which is authored and funded by Microsoft, and one of which is uh, authored by a very small team led by one person doing most of the heavy lifting, it wouldn't be obvious that you're going to go with that one. I sort of think it is both the history that we've got and also the cleanness of the new version and all of the um, all of the sort of proof of concept work that Johan has done. Like, I, I, I think it's actually pretty persuasive, but I think it might be nice to have the project be under the auspices of an organization where you can make it easy for other stakeholders to put money into it. Yeah, we should talk to him. Um, we have, uh, so Kevin Jans, who is the author of YGS, I think he's good friend with the author of Code Mirror. Uh, actually, the, the really good integration of Code Mirror and YGS is you know, maybe a, another good argument for, for using Code Mirror. Um, but yeah. Yeah, Kevin already provides findings for the new community. So, but in actually uh, in this group, what I understand is that those who are probably going to have to deal with the things that you had presented are Nick and Michelle in the LSP extension. Yeah, I mean, we're excited about that. Um, it is obviously going to be a challenge. Is is Mike even here? I don't even see Mike. I don't know what time is where Mike is. Um, so yes, it's definitely going to be a challenge. But there's, you know, there's LSP has the first mover in a lot of spaces on the editor, and so we were able to do some things that were maybe not uh, things that you would want every extension doing, right? Um, so it, to me, it's really important that, uh, if we're going to move forward and increase the amount of stuff that we are doing to the editors, that we need a better model, uh, we need a better underlying model and the code mirror model is great, right? Like all that stuff that we sh showed with the, you know, um, sorry, that Johan showed, I didn't show anything. Uh, that was awesome. Man. Um, you know, all the stuff with the compartments and just like all these things are so well thought out with what it will mean to be looking at uh, code with so many sources of annotation, potentially, you know, what does LSP mean with a shared document that you and I both have open, but we have different language servers that are looking at it, right? Like maybe you bring a copy editing language server and I got my little code editing server and, and they like fight, you know, and we, you know, the, I don't even know what that looks like because we haven't had a good enough model to really start thinking about that. So yes, it will be work, but we have been very <laughs> loud proponents of this for a long time and have even considered, you know, uh, doing some of that as a preview if we could get funded, but we were, we're not real, we're not full time. Right, like um, we just we don't have that, that bandwidth. But if we found the right people that needed it, but if there was an RC, not an RC, like an alpha, with this PR merged, would you start working on trying to get your LSP extension to work on top of this alpha, maybe including Chung's work as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have not had a lot of time to put towards that recently. Um, so if we, we had, we have traditionally not tracked alphas on that project, um, because it's, you know, we've been just trying to get stuff into people's hands, um, and the limited amount of effort that we have ha is hard to spend on an alpha. Um, this is a case where we would, we would have to consider doing that because nobody wants to have a six month, you know, like, oh, we got to wait until we get this other API in that we need because otherwise we're going to be monkey patching stuff and nobody wants that. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I feel like it would be 
uh, very much relevant to, you know, getting more contributors, right? Like not just, you know, not just all this. Yes, and Jason points out that um, some of our work in the actual nuts and bolts of getting Dom on the page of interacting with the LSP might be getting open sourced by Repolit within the next month, right? Like they've been, they kind of been running the hype cycle. Um, they just, uh, you know, they just dropped another big release of the features. So like once they actually release the features, they can only keep, you can only keep JavaScript proprietary for so long, right? Like, so, you know, the features are in people's browsers now, just the source is not open yet, right? So their work will become available. And if it is the case that all we got to do is just wire up the connections to these editors and do some light special stuff for notebooks <laughs> and polyglot languages and, you know, all the other stuff that we do with it. I, I mean, it's going to be great if we don't have to maintain how to draw squiggles under stuff that, that is, has lint, you know, like that. I don't want to do that. It, I mean, it's fun, but so I think, yeah, I mean, the, 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 we would want to see what those guys do before throwing a bunch of effort at this, right? I really want to see what the Replit guys give away. Yeah, there's a savage amount of stuff there. Yeah. And Code Mirror for desktop, I don't even know, I don't even know what that means, you know, like, are they, did they port it to QT or something? Because that'd be savage. Does anybody know about that? I don't know. But without Nick, you muted yourself if you didn't mean to. Okay. I mean. Yeah, you were cut in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> oh, weird. Oh, weird. Um, yeah, I'm just saying if. Uh, yeah, I, I can't really speak for Mike. We don't want to do this forever. If there are other communities that we can rely on, that is what we would like to do, except for the little tiny part that is Jupiter specific. And if that part gets bigger, well, then, you know, that's another story. But like, we don't want to have to do all of this stuff forever. Nick, um, since you worked more closely with code mirror than most of the rest of us um would you feel comfortable doing a review pass on this pr uh i can try and find some time on that i mean i'm sure it's not small um <laughs> and, you won't uh, be the only person you're not responsible for validating it but your uh, your review would be really valuable like i'm planning on reviewing it as well a lot of people are on this call for a reason. It's not going to be just you, but you in particular have worked with this exact set of features and these APIs that are going to change. So it would be helpful for you to weigh in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, for that that is probably, so frankly, that's how I would have reviewed it, right? Is just trying to load up LSP next to it and see what breaks. Um, yeah, yeah. Because I don't need to know everything. <laughs> I don't know if know everything that changed, right? Like to, to get that feature out the door. And then the other would be certain modes. Uh, so, you know, we, we ship a couple different code mirror modes. So understanding what's the relationship between tree sitter, uh, or sorry, uh, laser and uh, laser and, um, you know, the old simple mode, because I got a bunch of stuff out there for that. Um, the setting system, like you made a decision that makes it kind of look like CM5 a little bit, but is that like when we strive for backwards compatibility, is that going to limit us in some ways going forward? Um, but I just don't know enough yet. So those are those are the, the configurability and the um, and the syntax highlighting are the things that I would definitely be able to look into more rapidly than <laughs> how we're going to take a position in a now a uh, position in a 1D array and transform that into the LSP, you know, like I don't want to do that if Repolit's already done that, right? Because um, <laughs> uh, Mike is a whatever he is, you know, biochemist or whatever, and it was difficult for him to explain to me how that worked. So, um, you know. 
yeah, I have also, that's the, the Ripple again. Yeah, also, I mean, there is like kind of backward compatibility because I had to reuse a lot of uh, old modes because not all the languages are, for instance, has been ported to the new code model 6 and everything is working out. So yeah, there is like some compatibility layer or like maybe an adapter that you can use for that. Uh, that's one thing. And the other one is I'm not sure that, I mean, the API changed for uh, syntax lighting, uh, but yeah, it's still based on the uh, laser parser and I'm not sure that all the implementation changed a lot. So it should not be that hard to, to migrate things. So yeah, I don't know your code, but uh, yeah, that's my experience with a uh, reusing old stuff. I think Jason has a few questions in the chat that we haven't addressed. Nick, Namely, I was cheeky and I assigned you as a reviewer on the PR, by the way. Sorry, but not sorry. Also, sorry to interrupt you, Isabel. No, I was just saying, I think we haven't followed up on Jason had a question. So what's the plan moving forward about merging the master as well as some uh, REPL folk okay. contacts? Yeah. So I, yeah, okay. So to try to answer this question, I have uh, like a few features to finish, but yeah, it should be quick. I think end of the week will be done. I can rebate the PR and then uh, pass it as like ready for review. I have, then we have to fix tests, obviously. So uh, that may require uh, more people or more time, I don't know. Now, uh, can we merge that uh, in a few weeks? Yeah, I think if people review it uh, quite early and uh, maybe if we are two or, I don't know, maybe sometimes three to fix all the tests. Yeah, maybe it's, can, I think it can be done. Yeah. So that's the first question. I think there were other ones. One session with a little IT folks. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if other are, but I'm not. Uh, no, I don't know. The only people I have interacted with is the author of Camera on the discourse. I know people are migrating from Camera 5 to Camera 6 because there are a lot of questions. Uh, but yeah, I don't know about uh, other people. Seems we have reached the hour, maybe a good time to stop the recording. Well, and there's supposed to be another meeting starting, right? 